Storm King's Thunder is an absolute banger. This adventure came out in 2016, so it's a little bit older, but this is gonna be the perfect follow-up to the fifth edition starter set. Storm King's Thunder is huge. The players are gonna explore the rugged tundra, they're gonna fight dragons, they're gonna fight giants, they're gonna find heaps of cool magic items, and it's all gonna carry them up to level 10 or 11 or so. This video series is gonna show new dungeon masters, experienced dungeon masters, everybody, how to run this adventure step by step. Even if you're not planning to run this specific module, there's still gonna be something fun in this series for you, so please stick around. So this video is our overview video. We're gonna cover the broad plot of this adventure, and we're also gonna cover some of the changes that I'm making to give you kind of a roadmap to guide you through these guides. This is the guide for the guides. Now, I must warn you, I am about to spoil this entire campaign. So if you have any inkling that you want to be a player in this campaign, if you're a player currently or maybe in the future, you are not allowed to watch this series. You are not allowed to watch this video. If you watch this video, I will find you and I will put you in the bin. Spoilers in five, four, three, two, subscribe to my YouTube channel, one. This video series is going to be about 15 episodes long, with each video providing enough content for at least a single session of gameplay. There are some optional dungeons included, so I think if you skipped those, you could finish this whole campaign in 11 sessions or so, but that is playing at a breakneck speed, so 15 is probably a benchmark. My personal philosophy for running a pre-written adventure is to ignore half of the written content. These writers, they don't know you, they don't know your group, so whenever you have an idea that deviates from the adventure as written, I want you to follow your gut. And in the same way, if you have a different idea, anything that deviates from anything that I suggest in these guides, I want you to ignore me and follow your gut as well. However, there are two things I highly recommend you do before you even start your campaign. The first is that you should read this whole book cover to cover. And then second part is that you should watch every video in this series, because the more context you have for my suggestions, the better you're gonna be able to run Storm King Sunder. Every video here is gonna include playable companion content on Patreon, and all the Patreon resources mentioned in this video are free and publicly available. But for everything else, well, hey, there are costs associated with running the channel and Patreon support is what keeps the lights on. So please consider signing up and thank you. But before we kick off in earnest, hey, this video has a sponsor. How cool is that? Check this out. A big thank you to Eisendor's Vault of Tragic Treasure for sponsoring my tragic YouTube channel this week. This Kickstarter is running until the 9th of May. So before then, I want you to go check it out. Even if you don't want to back it, check it out, retweet it, get the word out there because there is a lot of value in this book. Isendor's Vault of Tragic Treasure is cram packed full of goodies. There are so many items in here. 300 magic items, that's so many. Now the thing is, they're not just random loot and random tables that you handball to your players and go, here you go, have a thing, have a sword, Ooh, I don't know what it does. It's also full of lore. These items are plot devices that you can use to enrich your game. Do you know what? It's, I'm, I'm pretty stoked on this, I like it a lot. You know, go check it out. <laughs> Look. As a person with my own aspirations in publishing, it is super important to me that we get out there and we show our support for independent publishers. And this is a really good product, so I would like us to get out there, check out this sponsor, check out this Kickstarter, and even if you don't have the money to back it, hey, retweet it, get the noise out there. Thank you so much for sponsoring the channel. Everybody say thanks sponsor <laughs> in the comments. End of ad read. The broad plot of Storm King's Thunder revolves around giants, a dragon, and a kraken all plotting against each other with human society caught somewhere in the middle. The general themes throughout this campaign are going to be chaos, opportunity, glory, and treachery. Bang, 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 bang. There are three major problems that the players are going to have to contend with. Problem one is that the Ordning has shattered. Giant society has a divinely imposed hierarchy called the Ordning. And in this hierarchy, Storm Giants are right up here on the tippy top and King Hecaton is their leader. However, Anam the Allfather, who's the god of the Giants, shattered the Ordning to punish his children for their complacency. I don't know why they're so complacent. Maybe they should have made their bed, who knows. When the Ordning is reforged by the Allfather, the hierarchy could be shaped differently. So various giant lords are trying to outperform each other with grand feats to impress the Allfather and earn their spot at the top of the reforged Ordning. Now, the only person with the power and authority to reign in these rampaging giant lords is the person who sits on the Worm Skull throne, King Hecaton, the Lord of the Storm Giants. However, problem number two is that King Hecaton is missing. You see, in the Storm Giant Court of Maelstrom, there is unrest. A while ago, Queen Neri, who was King Hecaton's wife, was found to be murdered. Now, she was fond of human society, that's us, and she would sometimes go visit their shores, but she was discovered to be murdered by small folk. 
King Hecaton's younger brother Uther is the person that found her. So the king goes into this rage and vows vengeance on all the small folk, but his daughter Sarissa calms him down and he agrees to investigate further before declaring all out war on civilization. So then he goes and investigates, but then he disappears. Now it's just Sarissa sitting on the throne, her uncle Uther, who now totally distrusts the small folk, and the court advisor Imerith. A third problem is that Imerith, the court advisor, is actually an imposter. This is about to get a little bit complicated. So Imerith is actually a blue dragon, disguised as a storm giant. So let's rewind 40,000 years or so, where dragons and giants had an ancient war which toppled the greatest giant society of Astoria. So they are natural enemies historically. Now Imerith is trying to pit the storm giants against the small folk and kill two birds with one regicide. She contacted the Kraken Society, a clearly evil organization who worships a big tentacly boy, to murder Queen Neri and capture King Hecaton. And now she either needs to convince young Sarissa to avenge her father or get her off the throne so her hot-headed uncle can start the war. Now that's the whole plot pretty much, and to resolve these three issues the party is going to have to go through these steps, and you can pause the video and read this because I don't feel like reading it out loud, this video is already too long, go for it. From that plot summary we've got these rampaging giant lords who are trying to impress their god, and we've got the Kraken Society as our two secondary villains, and then we have Imrith the blue dragon as our main villain. Now at this point in my video script, we're going off script, uh, I have a bunch of notes about Imerith as a villain because I think it's important to really cement in your mind who the villain is and what they want. But the thing is, I've only written a few episodes of this guide so far and my opinion of who she is and what she wants might change over time. So instead, I'm going to put that on Patreon, free for everybody, you can get it even if you're not a patron, and that way it's a living document and I can update it and make sure that it is always up to date for you. I'm advocating a lot of changes from the book, all right, and we're going to deviate in a lot of ways. But here are eight, eight, yeah, eight, eight major changes that I'm suggesting to either the story of Storm King Sunder or changes to how D&D runs in general. Our first change, we are simplifying our cast by cutting and combining characters, NPCs, where possible. You might have noticed I've already cut the two evil daughters of King Hecaton, and I've done that because they're kind of redundant in a not fun way. I'm not always going to give a reason as to why a character gets cut, but the general reason is because I think simplifying the story is always useful for Dungeons and Dragons. And as a rule of thumb, if I don't mention a character in this guide, it's safe for you to presume that they just don't exist. A second change is that we're going to start the campaign at level 4 in chapter 2. Now this is the chapter where the giants attack the town of Bryn Shander. Now the adventure wants us to pick one of three starting towns, like we're picking a Pokemon starter, but we're just going to pick Bryn Shander and then change it to suit our purposes. And when you're choosing that party and making that party, that fourth level party, you could import characters from a previous campaign, like the starter set, but I would strongly suggest you make new characters with custom built backstories for this campaign and tell this story with a clean slate and discard all that old baggage. A third change is that we're going to abstract chapter 3 into a montage that takes place over a single session. Chapter 3 is normally a big open world session that is going to take you like 16 hours. We're going to do it in one session. Our fourth major change is that whichever of the five rampaging giant factions that attacks Brent Shander, we're steering the players towards that same giant lord to collect their conch of teleportation after chapter four. A fifth change is that we're going to skip all overland travel. If the players want to go somewhere available to them on the map, decide how long it takes, presume they have the resources and the means to overcome any challenges along the way, and then move on with the game. The goal here is to respect our players' time, to respect our time as well. One fun thing to do when you skip travel though is to ask some of the players to imagine and roleplay a short scene that happens along the way. For example, here's a fun scene around a campfire, or a fun scene where the party member gets stuck in a bug. Just do a little bit of roleplaying and, and move on. A sixth big change is that we're going to insert special player moments for our party. Now this is something I covered in my Lost Minds of Fandouble guides. I just want you to work with your players on their backstories and take one element from each player's backstory to somehow tie and incorporate into the campaign so they each get to be the star of the show at some point. We're going to avenge the rogue's father or we're going to discover some artifact that the wizard's been looking for or maybe we're going to accomplish some heroic deed that the party's been pining for. Change some element of the campaign to be unique to your game and your party. Our seventh big change is that we're going to overhaul the way non-player allies work. 
So there are a few times where this module wants the party to have a cool NPC ally, and that's fine, but the module doesn't know how to make it work. For example, there's this giant named Harshnag, and he's really powerful, and he joins the party but only fights at half strength because he doesn't want to overshadow the party. Now that's kind of silly, right? Why would he fight at half strength, life or death? But that's the problem that you run into when you treat NPC allies like full combatants. Instead, we're doing something which I'm calling battle companions. Now each battle companion has a unique ability that somehow affects the party, but a battle companion is not a standard combatant. They don't have a regular stat block and you don't put a token on the battlefield for them, so they can't be targeted or affected by attacks. Now it might seem on the surface that this ally is doing very little to help the party, but this is just an abstraction of combat. This character is not present on the meta level, they're not taking up time or messing up the party balance, but in the fiction of the story, yeah of course Harshnag is in this battle helping you out, stomping monsters into dust. Now you can find my full rules for battle companions on Patreon, and I expect that some gamers are going to hate this suggestion and want to argue with me, but I just want to let you know right here, I don't care. Battle companions are rad, and you're going to like them. Check out the supplement. The eighth change we're making, this is probably the most important piece of information in the whole video, and I'm about to get to it. Now you'll notice I've left this important information at the end of the video, because if you subscribe and watch this whole video, that tells YouTube to promote my content more because you've watched the whole thing and it massively helps out. So I'm sneaky and thank you for watching this far. And this important information is this exposition checklist. Exposition is just a word that describes when you explain background information about a story. So ooh, this is my tragic backstory, or have you met my father, the plot device? I don't know. So my goal with this is to seed every crucial piece of information in the adventure, seed it before it comes up in play. For example, when the players meet Imrith the Blue Dragon in chapter 4, I want them to have heard of her at some point before then. So this big old list has every piece of exposition incremented into little factoids, and each little factoid is broken into which chapter I think you should reveal this information. Now maybe the party finds a book which reveals the nature of the Ordning, maybe they meet an NPC who knows about the conscience of teleportation, and maybe they have a prophetic dream which features Imrith the Blue Dragon in some way. The players need to hit these story beats at some point. So what I'm suggesting is print these lists out and keep them with you when you're running the game, and when you think the players understand something from this checklist, cross it off. The players know this information, good, success. Now it's okay to seed something multiple times because the players do forget things, and it's okay to get ahead of yourself and start crossing off things from chapter 4 when you're only up to chapter 3. This is just a tool to keep you on track. This is just a tool to keep you uh, measuring your progress. Exposition checklists for the entire campaign are available for free right now on Patreon. Check it out. And if this kind of list thing stresses you out, you go, ooh, oh, I've got so much to do. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm so stressed. That's okay. Just don't use them. That's fine. They're an optional tool. And just like the, the write-up that I'm doing of the big baddie, this is going to be a living document. I'm going to add to this and change it and tweak it so that by the end of this and by the time we're all experts in Storm King Sunder after 15 episodes in this series, this will be a really complete list of what you need to seed and when you need to seed it. Now I hope that you are as stoked on Storm King Thunder as I am. This is going to be a really fun series. Now all my patrons down here already know that on Patreon I'm still making Lost Minds of Fandelver content, so if you want extra handouts, extra resources, you can find that all on Patreon, and I'm also doing a Candlekeep mystery series coming up as well. So it's all going to kind of be happening in tandem. Whew, this is going to be great. Don't forget to like and subscribe, thank you so much, I'll see you in the next video.